For the lasing process to be initiated in a laser, all electrons in the laser material must be in higher electron energy levels. Now you might say, mm, that sounds pretty good, except if you read it carefully and you see this word all. It is not the case that every single electron in the material must be at a higher energy level. Some of them are, and where we would normally expect quite a few to be down here and one or two to be up there, what we find in the laser is this thing called population inversion, where the unexpected happens. You've got more up than you've got down, and of course when these things drop down, that's when you get the laser process happening. But that word all is the fly in the ointment. Students, please note that this question is not examinable. It's simply included here because it is a very important basic concept, but it is not directly examinable. Okay, we're getting on to the multiple choice questions. Good old multiple choice questions. Something you must try and do. First of all, Read the question very carefully, that's obvious. Secondly, you should try and find an answer before you look at the alternatives. Try and get an idea of what the answer is going to be. Because if you then find one of the alternatives given to you, and there are four of them, you will be pretty sure that you've got it right. That doesn't mean that you aren't going to check a little bit more carefully, but get an idea of where the answer is, the sort of ballpark answer. And then we can go and check. The next technique that you would use is to go through the questions and eliminate those that are clearly incorrect. Get rid of them and you might get yourself down to a choice of one in two. If you're still completely stumped, at least you've got a 50% chance of getting it right and not only a 25% if you guessed in the first place. So let's have a look at them. Right, first question. We've got two trolleys, a two kilogram trolley and a four kilogram trolley. They stand on a frictionless horizontal tabletop. They're connected by a rubber band. There's a rubber band, an elastic band. The two trolleys are then moved apart. In other words, we stretch that rubber band, we move them apart. And when the trolleys are released, they move towards each other, collide and stick together. So when they get here to that event, the point of collision, there they are together. And there's a piece of press stick or something, and they stick together. After the collision, the two trolleys, which are now joined, what will they do? Will they move off in the direction of the two kilogram trolley? Now, I would suggest that that's unlikely because the bigger trolley is surely going to have a greater impact. We've got to be a little bit careful there because, of course, the force acting on the greater trolley, uh, the uh, greater mass, will also cause less acceleration and therefore the velocity after the impulsive force has acted on it will be less than for the two kilogram but you can see we're edging towards an answer. I would still query that. Move in the direction of B, the four kilogram, with a decreased velocity. Hmm, not too bad. I'm not entirely happy, but it's a bit more plausible than this one. Move in the direction of B, the four kilogram trolley, with an increased velocity. Nah, surely not. I mean, it's going to have to... Uh, uh, take account of the momentum of this. So, no, that's not right. Remain stationary. How could it possibly remain stationary? And yet, if we look at this one, we start thinking about trolleys, we start talking about some uh, explosive force that's brought them together, or this elastic force has got them moving, and then we realize that whatever brought them in together was an, an impulse, we'll call it F delta T. In other words, their changes in momentum would have been the same. Now, when you hold these two bodies out, their total, the total momentum of the system is zero because neither of them are moving. 
So what that tells me is that if the total momentum was zero before the event where they were let go, once they collide, what's going to happen? After that collision, the total momentum must also be equal to zero. Now, that means that there is no movement of the combined forces one way or the other because that would mean that momentum has not been conserved and therefore my only possible answer is D. Right, next question is about forces. Let's take a look. All right, we've got a system of forces here showing at least some of the forces. I'm not sure if all of the forces are being shown, but what we see is a cart with a uh, the, uh, the part that's being pulled presumably by a horse or somebody and there are a couple of forces here the force where it, this handle of the cart is is attached and there's a reaction force of some sort there direction of travel okay and we've got some sort of force acting down on the ground and then a reaction force okay Small cart pulled along a rough road by a force F. There's the force F acting at an angle. The direction of travel is there. Immediately we see mm, we're going to get something to do with components here. Um, consider the following statements. F A could be the component of the force F in the direction of travel. Well, certainly that is a force in the same direction, F A, is the same direction as the direction of travel and so yes it could quite conceivably because it is from where the uh, handle is attached and we know that there's a force in the handle so yes that could be correct or well, that is correct it could be uh, the component of F. FC and FD could be an action-reaction pair representing respectively the weight of the cart and the normal force. Okay, I know that I asked this question a little earlier. It's the same question and I've asked it for a purpose. It is very important that you realize that these two things, FC and D, action-reaction pairs, are the weight of the cart and the normal force of reaction. That cannot be correct because the this is the force of the wheel on the ground. Now it is true that that force exerts on the ground because of the weight of the cart and uh, the, the, the sort of overall pull of that cart down on the earth. But nevertheless, the point of contact, at that point, it is a contact force and it is not a weight. It is not a gravitational force. So this cannot be an action-reaction pair. I will not accept that, and nor should you. The resultant force that causes the cart to move could be given by the equation, and we say could be because we don't know if this is all the forces, but for the forces that we're given, if these are all the forces, then Fa, that component, that could be the component of the force F, in the direction of travel, minus mu, which is going to be the coefficient of friction, depending on the kind of surfaces over here, and Fd, which is quite possibly the normal force of, yeah, must be the normal force of reaction of the ground on the cart. And so if I subtract that frictional force, mu Fd, from Fa, the component of the force in that direction, that could quite conceivably be the resultant force that causes the motion. And so therefore, 1 and 3. Now once you've gone through all of this, the answer falls out of bed, so that's fine. Next question is about that lovely little equation which you all know to do with uh, interference and diffraction. Uh, sine theta is equal to m lambda over a. And we'll go and see what these things mean. Learning Channel offers an extensive educational collection ranging from grades 8 to 12 in alignment with the national curriculum statement. We offer DVD and workbook sets in a number of different subjects. To buy the Learning Channel series, check out our website on www.learn.co.za or call us on 011 639 0179.